today we will cover other conditions of the lower GI tract. Diverticulosis and diverticulitis are two connected conditions of the intestine. Diverticulosis is the abnormal presence of out pockets or pouches on the surface of the small intestine or colon. So as we can see in this picture here, the pocketing structures, these are called diverticuli or diverticulum. And uh, then we also have diverticulitis, which um, we mentioned before, we've seen this suffix itis. And this is the acute inflammation of the diverticuli. Again, whenever we see this ending here, it indicates inflammation. For example, bronchitis or hepatitis, um, these are conditions involving inflammation and the names all end in itis. So diverticulosis and diverticulitis are most common in Western and industrialized countries. So based on what we know about these countries and the developing countries, uh, we might be able to say here that lifestyle and diet play a role in these conditions. Historically, these conditions are associated with low fiber intake. You know, if we think about the traditional structure of the Western diet, it tends to be low in fiber. Also, also, patients usually have a history of constipation and increased colonic pressure. Recently, the focus has been on the increased inflammatory response. Because it's not just that we have these abnormal out pockets that can trap fecal matter, it's the inflammation afterwards that can lead to more damage. In addition to low fiber intake and inflammation level, other risk factors include obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, use of steroid hormones, alcohol and caffeine consumption, and cigarette smoking. So as we can see here, there's a lot of lifestyle factors that come into play. Due to the presence of the out pockets or pouches on the surface of the intestines, fecal matter can be trapped. So we have these pits all over. As we see from the lumen side, and um, these are dense in the lumen here. So we see these as pockets kind of bulging on the outside of the intestine, the diverticula. So when this happens, uh, intraluminal pressure will increase and with that the pouches become bigger. And also because the fecal matter is trapped inside the pouches, they are not moving towards excretion. So over time, it may become inflamed. Also remember that fecal matter contains bacteria. So when it does become inflamed, that is diverticulitis. So we can see here the difference of the diverticulosis with just the presence of these um, pouches here compared to the diverticulitis where we see the fecal matter is trapped in here and some changes going on with the inflammation. In severe cases, patients could develop bleeding abscess, obstruction, fistula, and perforation. If this happens, it can have a systemic impact and it may require surgical intervention in certain cases. People with diverticulosis do not usually apport report any symptoms. However, when they become inflamed, we can observe fever, abdominal pain, GI bleeding, as well as increased white blood cell count. To diagnose this, we need medical imaging so we can observe what is going on, 
like this picture we see here using the endoscope, um, we can definitely see the pouches here. We can also observe a thickened wall um, if there's abscess or any signs of inflammation, and these would all be evidence for the conditions. To treat diverticulosis, we only need to modify the nutrient contents of the diet. So therefore, nutrition therapy is very important. The focus is on fiber intake and also the use of probiotics and prebiotics, which will optimize the colon environment. If we are dealing with diverticulitis, the inflammation, obviously it will be more severe. So with the inflammation, we would order NPO and that will allow for a complete bowel rest. Also, if there is an infection, we would call for the use of antibiotics. And in the presence of inflammation and infection, in, the case, um, in many cases, this can affect nutrition, especially if it lasts a long time. So this would mean that the stress factors would be persisting for a long period. Therefore, energy and nutrient requirements will increase accordingly. Also, if we had some sort of complication like a perforation fistula that requires surgery, complications like these would also affect nutrition significantly. For the nutrition assessment, we should have a thorough interview on patient history. And when it comes to diet history, we really need to focus on assessing the patient's fiber intake. Problems for the nutrition diagnosis of diverticulosis or diverticulitis can include altered GI function and inadequate fiber intake. For intervention, we mentioned nutrition therapy is very important, and fiber intake is the focus of the nutrition therapy. Of course, we want the high fiber diet to come with adequate fluid intake. Current research evidence does not support the restriction of seeds and nuts and things of this nature. Although many people think that these items may get trapped easier, but the evidence at least for now, shows that uh, they are no worse than any other foods. For fiber, we know that in the Western diet, it can be a challenge at times to include adequate fiber through a whole food approach. Therefore, we may want to consider a supplement. For example, we could use psyllium to provide adequate fiber as an intervention strategy. And if we have diverticulitis, as we already said, we would want complete bowel rest, so nothing by mouth, so that those sections of the intestine can heal. So our next topic is going to be on common surgical interventions that occur in the intestine. As we know, uh, we have the small intestine and the large intestine or the colon. So here we see ileostomy and colostomy. In ileostomy, we see the ileo here for ileum. So obviously this is a surgery that affects the ileum. And then when we see the ostomy, this suffix means the creation of a stoma or an opening. We previously explained in the diseases of the oral cavity that stoma means opening. Therefore, stomatitis doesn't mean the inflammation in the stomach. It does mean the inflammation of the mucosa of the oral cavity. So whenever we see ostomy, this is a surgery that creates an artificial opening or stoma. For ileostomy, that means that the artificially created opening is at the ileum of the small intestine. 
In this case, usually the patient's colon and rectum are removed. This could be due to many things like cancer, severe trauma, or severe infl inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or UC. If we see colostomy, the artificial opening is done at the colon. And this is done because the rectum of the patient is removed. Therefore, we must create an artificial opening so that the waste can be disposed of. Pouches are attached to these artificial stomas to collect the waste. Please review the normal structure of the intestine, both the large and small intestine, to help better understand the consequences of these surgeries. So, also instead of doing a pouch, sometimes they'll create an internal pouch as we see here, um, and these serve the same function as the rectum. What is not included on this slide is if we have a jejunostomy, so this means that the stoma is in the jejunum, the midsection of the small intestine. In this case, nothing will pass to the point of the ileum or colon, whether they are left in the body or um, have been removed. The issue is that if the stoma is created in any section of the small intestine, we expect that the patient will lose a lot of fluids and electrolytes. And this is because we know that the colon absorbs a lot of water, and if we lose the whole colon and the end of the small intestine, we will still have a lot of unabsorbed water. In this case, the fluid will go into the pouches attached to the stoma, so the patients will have excessive fluid loss, and we need to be keeping this in mind. The goal for nutrition intervention in this case is to decrease the risk of obstruction. Again, maintenance of fluid and electrolyte balance is very important because patients who undergo these types of surgeries are at high risk for imbalance. We also want to reduce fecal output and minimize flatulence. So if we think about it, at this point, the anal control of defecation is gone. We have created an artificial stoma upstream from that sphincter, therefore we no longer have control. And after surgery, we want to transition a patient from PN or even EN to the oral diet. We see that studies indicate that early PO feeding is tolerated by most patients. This means that we don't have to give them bowel rest for too long. We should start the PO feeding early, and we don't have to be giving them a lot, but at least some for stimulation, which is helpful for the remaining intestine. Patients will also need to eat slowly and chew thoroughly, as is the case for many GI diseases. Nutrition therapy for ostomies, depending on the, which section of the GI tract they are located, um, there may be different issues to deal with. So we do need to know which surgery we are dealing with. And we can go ahead and take a look at these tips. Having smaller bites, that's understandable. Having a regular eating schedule. Um, eating at the same time so that the body can have a routine to expect and to adapt to. And of course, smaller, more frequent meals. We can also be eating larger meals in the middle of the day, which will help to decrease the stool output at night and allow the patient to get better rest. Again, remember the control of defecation is gone in this case. We also want to avoid certain spicy and fried foods. And also we should know that there are foods that thicken stools, such as banana, applesauce, rice, and pasta. This would be a little better for the patient because if we think about it, um, if we have a more liquidy stool, it's going to be more inconvenient for them. 
There are also odor generating foods. So if we don't want to have that effect, patients need to know which foods should be limited or avoided. Same thing with foods that cause gas production. In a previous topic, I think it was for IBS, we already saw a whole list of foods that are associated with increased gas production, so please refer to that table. Also, do not drink from a straw, smoke, or chew gum. All of these actions can cause the individual to swallow more air, therefore they will have more discomfort. And this last point here, we need to pay attention to fluid intake because after these surgeries, the patients will have increased fluid loss. And of course, they may need to drink more in hot weather if they are sweating more. This just makes common sense. But uh, really, we do need to stress these points during the nutrition education. The next slides are specific recommendations regarding food and food groups, so please study these on your own.